So the labor market's a little bit confusing. You just heard Tyler say that we're back at pre-pandemic unemployment levels, but job openings are starting to shrink, and now more than half of large companies say they're looking at layoffs. So how certain is the strength in the economy? I still think that we're going to have job gain as we move into the end of this year, early next year. Uh, a lot of people are still looking at different jobs. We saw a lot of moving around over this last course of the year. Uh, people leaving jobs, getting better jobs. And, I, you know, I, I'm not convinced yet that we're, we're headed towards that R word. But the Federal Reserve has said that there needs to be some more pain felt in the employment space in order to get inflation under control. And even the Biden administration has said that the economy needs to move toward a place of more steady, stable growth. So from a jobs picture, what does that look like to you? It's, it's hard to say that. I mean, we definitely have to go towards more steady growth. We definitely have to bring down inflationary pressures. People are still filling them at the kitchen table every day. Uh, we need to do that. But I, I also think there's a way to do that with by creating good opportunities for people so they have opportunities to get into the middle class. And not enough people in America are working in those jobs, quite honestly, if they can get them into the middle class. What is the middle class right now? How much does someone need to make to be able to make ends meet? Because a lot of the companies who are watching this broadcast this morning are wondering, what do I need to pay people to get them hired and get them to stay? Well, certainly more than minimum wage. I think that we have to get people into better paying jobs. We need to get people into better st stability when it comes to benefits. If, when, you know, the 401k, a pension plan, potentially, if we have, if they have them. Uh, I think there's a lot of Americans out there right now that, that, that have gone through the last two years. Uh, a lot of concern in the pandemic. They, they were working in a, in a job maybe making minimum wage, maybe they had two or three jobs. Really, I think the best way to describe what is what is a middle class job is a job you can work one job, get a good pay, so you don't have to work two and three jobs to support your family. The federal minimum wage is still $7.25. Several states are still using that as their minimum wage. Does the administration see any path going forward to raise that? You've tried in the past, and it hasn't well, worked. It shocks me that there are members of uh, in the building behind me, uh, if you can't see the building behind me, it's the Capitol Hill, that people think that families can raise their family on $7, $7 plus uh, on the minimum wage in this country. It's really amazing to me uh, that people think that families can get by on minimum wage in this country. We can't. Uh, we're working. We passed legislation. The House voted it. It's in the Senate. It hasn't moved there. We'll have to see after the elections what happens as far as moving that minimum wage forward. Uh, the president did sign the executive order raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. But in fairness to a lot of companies, companies have already raised it far beyond the minimum wage in the country. They've gone to $15, $16, $17, $18 an hour to attract people into their businesses to work. Your agency in recent weeks has moved to change a rule and reclassify gig workers for companies like Uber and Lyft and DoorDash as employees rather than contractors. You're soliciting comments right now. What's the feedback that you've gotten about whether that's a good move? Well, we haven't necessarily said what companies are affected by it and what business are affected by it. What we're looking at is people that, that, that are employees that work for companies that are being taken advantage of as independent contractors. We want to end that. We have plenty of businesses in this country like dishwashers and delivery drivers and areas like that where people uh, are working in, for a business uh, that other employees in that business are employees and they're, 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 they're labeling them as independent contractors. So we're going to look at this. We're in the rulemaking process now. We're taking in the comments now and we'll see when the comments come in what the final rule looks like. But there are pros and cons. I mean, on one hand, yes, it would afford those workers benefits. On the other other hand, it might deny them some flexibility in, in setting their schedule. If the company then says, you're an employee, you have to work a minimum of this many hours per week. Well, let's see what the final rule looks like, number one. But again, the flexibility is not an excuse to pay somebody as an employee. Uh, you can't use that as an excuse. But we'll see what the final rule is. And then uh, when that's done, you and I have plenty of conversation about it. The infrastructure law that was passed last year, there have been some estimates about how many jobs that would create. I believe Moody said it would be about 800,000 jobs. Do you have an accounting? of how many jobs that's created yeah. so far and where they are? No, I don't have what they what they've said today, but they said the infrastructure investment will create 800,000 jobs, and then the spinoff in the private sector industry will create much, many more jobs. Some of these are construction jobs, so folks that are working on these construction projects will be able to go to these other private sector jobs when they're done. Uh, I don't have an exact number of how many jobs are on the street today. Uh, I know there are thousands of projects that uh, predominantly out of transportation, Secretary Buttigieg has put, the, put them out there, and, and, and we're starting to see them cities and towns all across America. Are you confident that those jobs would still go forward even if the economy starts to slow, that a private sector company might say, you know what, we want to participate in that program, but let's wait a couple years to see how the economy looks before we commit to it. Oh, no, I, I, think, I think the projects from the Infrastructure Investment Act will 
will go forward. Uh, those pro th that do those monies are there. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we did have a downturn in the economy, those jobs would keep people working through a difficult time if, if we came to that point in our country. Uh, the private investment that, that I'm talking about is in cities and towns that will spin off of these investments of new, new, new rails, new streets, new bridges, new broadband internet, uh, charging stations, all of this di these different investments will help our economy moving forward with new development down the road. I believe that same Moody's estimate said that about 12 percent of those 800,000 jobs would be union jobs. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could just provide a commentary, a snapshot on union membership in America right now. Because if you look at the most recent survey available from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, it showed that uh, labor jobs decreased by more than 240,000 in 2021. We don't know what that looks like in 2022, yeah. so I'm wondering if you do. Yeah, I don't, have, I don't have the number of 2022, but 2021 was a unique year. The numbers went down in a lot of ways because companies, unions weren't organizing, number one. Uh, and number two, we had a pandemic, and a lot of people retired, left their business, or, or they retired, they, those jobs weren't backfilled by companies. Uh, I think that, you know, I don't think the unions will see all this interest in unionization right now in the country that we're seeing. Uh, you know, polling, I think it's like 65, 70 percent of Americans are looking favorably upon unions as in the past for the highest in 50 years. I don't think you'll see the benefit of that organizing until probably 2023, 2024. And what are the forces that will drive that? I think people are looking for better opportunities for themselves. I think that, you know, you have a lot of workers that, that are, uh, the pandemic, you know, when I think about the pandemic, I think it's done a few things for the workplace. Number one, it's it's changed the workplace. We have a lot of hybrid situations going on. It's changed what people want out of their careers. Uh, it's also changed people's perception of not want to be taken advantage of, thinking that unions can help them grow. Uh, I'm because they can't argue, the worker it, it won't be successful arguing or bargaining on their own behalf. They well, need I think, a collective organization. Yeah, when, when Collective power, there's more, more, more support. Although I'll tell you, companies have done a, a good job of, of working through people, keeping, trying to keep people, retaining people, and, and recruiting people to their companies. They've realized uh, in this last couple of years that they have to do more to retain and recruit people. So, what do you think the Biden administration's um, reputation among organized labor is right now? I know that the president, when he was on the campaign trail, said that there was no one that would be a bigger proponent for labor than he would be. He made a splash in the early days by canceling the Keystone Pipeline, and a lot of those union jobs went away. So where are we yeah, well, halfway through the term right now? Sorry, if, you, if you're if you're a, a union member, uh, you should be looking favorably upon this administration uh, for a whole host of reasons. There's, the, you know, one of which the Labor Secretary of the United States has a union book in his pocket. I think that that's something that's important. But the president is also focused on working people in America. He talks about unions a lot. He mentions the word union, but he talks about people. He talks about creating a pathway into the middle class, uh, both for, for union work workers and non-union workers and you know the president wants to see from the very beginning when he started to run for president uh, he talked about creating an economy from from the bottom up and the middle out meaning creating pathways into the middle class now whether that's unionization or whether that's a good job and a lot of good opportunities but he didn't talk about inflation being as high as it has been we didn't I'm know it was going to be that high but I'm wondering at what point does that eclipse well let's be honest any positive feelings that, that no, a worker would have sorry I need to cut you off there no there's no question about it inflation is an issue that we're dealing with. We're not running away from it. You know, inflation was not caused by President Biden, was not caused by President Biden's policies. Uh, inflation is, in, in large part, is due to a pan global pandemic, uh, a worldwide recession uh, that's going on, and, and inflation that's in double digits in other countries. Uh, oil, oil, oil prices going up, the war in Ukraine, there's a lot of components to that. And, you know, the president is very serious talking to us, the cabinet, to make sure we're doing everything we can to bring those inflationary pressures down. You know, we've seen some of the gas prices come down. We've seen a little bit of inflation come down, but not enough. And none of us are satisfied. The president's not satisfied until we bring those costs down yeah. to the kitchen table. American people are concerned about a lot of things right now in this world, and inflation is one of them. There are two major policy pillars from the president's campaign that have ended up on the cutting room floor, and that is immigration reform and child care. Yeah. I'm wondering what impact do you think each of those would have on the the economy and yeah. on the labor market yeah. if you were to be able to advance either one of those? I mean, I think we should we have to advance both. And, and I'll start with child care. Child care uh, is is a, a, a basic necessity to get millions of women back into the workforce in a full-time basis 
child care has not been addressed by this country or by most states in this country for the last 50 years. The cost is too high for the average family, and we can't retain the workers in those industries. We lost a lot of workers in the child care industry because of paying them minimum wage or a little bit above minimum wage. I saw a stat that 100,000 workers from the child care left. industry have left since the pandemic. But how do you get them back? We have to, we have to respect them and pay, pay their better wages. Anyone watching today that has kids in child care, you know you're paying 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of your salary for child care. A lot of families have made the decision we don't want to have two people working. One person will stay home, maybe work part time and make up those costs. So that, that issue has to be resolved, number one. It's not just an economic issue. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a human human rights issue in our country to get good child care in this country. The second part, immigration. Um, right now, we're talking about worker shortages. And what's happening is uh, the political parties are getting immigration all tied up. One party saying, showing pictures of the border. And meanwhile, if you talk to businesses that support those, those, those congressional folks, they're saying, we need immigration reform. Every place I've gone in the country and talked to every major business, every small business, every single one of them is saying, we need immigration reform. We need comprehensive immigration reform. They want to create a pathway for citizenship into our country, and they want to create pa better pathways for visas in our country. We have Parties have very different ideas about what that would look like, but well, even just they're from not a offering, they're not, I, I, haven't I haven't heard any of the parties offer. Well, the Democrats have put through a plan, but I haven't seen the other side offer, offer a solution yet. Yet, we need a bipartisan fix here. Um, on inflation, do you believe that immigration reform would actually solve price pressures if you were able to get more immigrant workers into the economy? Well, I'll tell you right now, if we don't if we don't solve immigration, we're going to have a economic. We're talking about uh, we're talking about worrying about recessions. We're talking about inflation. I think we're going to have a bigger catastrophe if we don't get more workers into our society, and we do that by immigration. What does the supply chain look like going into the holiday season? I feel good where we are. I mean, obviously, we, we talked off air a minute ago about we have two big negotiations going on. We have the ports uh, and the shipping companies that are going on right now. Now that's moving steady uh, right now. I, I stay in very close contact with both the companies and the unions. So you don't see a rail strike on November 9th? No, that, that's the ports. The ports. The ports. And, and on the rail stuff, you know, we, we had 12, 12 unions came up with an agreement. Uh, six have voted, ratified their contract. Uh, five are still out for ratification. One union voted down, and uh, they're at the table right now working with the companies, hopefully coming up with a, a new proposal to put in front of the members. So right now we're just moving along here. We'll, we'll know in the next couple of weeks here. But I, I feel good where we are today. The cost of shipping containers has gone down. I know that you've been personally involved in training commercial truck drivers. Yep. Do you feel like each part of this system that you've solved the variables that were leading to all of the pain last year? Yeah, I mean the pain last year, but but you got to think now the infrastructure investment bill is going to invest in the rails. We're going to be at, uh, you know we're going to be needing more, more supplies on our rails, moving goods and service goods around the country. Uh, you see the ports in L.A., Long Beach. You see the ports around the country. They're adding capacity there, so we're looking at more opportunities there. Uh, you know, solve it. You know, we've solved the, the problem of, of the pandemic and bringing goods and services into the country. Um, now, there's still some issues in, in other parts of the globe that, you know, had to shut the factories down. So as they got their factories up and running, we'll see more of those services, those goods coming into the country. Uh, and I think the president's emphasis on buy and, and build in America and more manufacture in America is going to be key for the future of our supply chain. You m remarked recently on the low turnover among cabinet officials yeah. in this administration before the midterms. Does that mean that you see a lot of turnover after the midterms? No, I think, you know, I think that we have a good, strong team and we're working very well together. I mean, obviously, I've, uh, this is my first uh, venture into federal government, so I, I don't know what the average lifespan or, or, or service of a cabinet person is, but uh, as of right now, I'm just focused on my job and I think a lot of people are focused on their job. We have a lot, lot going on. The implementation of the CHIPS bill, implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act, implementation of, of the, uh, the the infrastructure bill. Uh, we're working on job training, workforce development, apprenticeship. So there's a lot of good things happening in this administration. For officials who may or may not be considering what their next step is, do you think that the U.S. edging closer to a recession would make that decision easier or harder for them? As far as the cabinet? Yes. I think it's harder for all of us. I think if, if you know, you, what you don't want to do, you want to just continue to work with the administration. We've made great progress in a lot of different areas, and we have challenges in front of us. And I think that, you know, some of our work's not done. I mean, we've done a lot here at the Department of Labor to re revamp the way we do job training, working very closely, trying to work closely with businesses. Uh, you know, when I go on the road, I talk to business groups all the time. I was in West Palm Beach last week. I spoke to a chamber of commerce down there. I think it's really important for us to continue those conversations. So the reason why I say that to you is, is that we get ideas from them about workforce development, job training. What are they looking for out of their employees? Yeah. You mentioned um, 
the midterms earlier, and we've talked now about immigration, child care, minimum wage. All of those are policy priorities for your party. But how much of what you're able to do will be shaped by the midterms, and how much of the agenda is in flux until you know what Congress looks like? I think at the end of the day, no matter what happens in a, in a couple weeks here, uh, Elected officials, Congress, whether they're Democrat or Republican, need to work on behalf of the American people. And we need to put the American American public first. You have to put them back at the top of the pedestal. It's not about parties. It's about, about delivering for people. Uh, and, it, it, you know, depending on what part of the country you're in, people feel differently about where their own situation is, whether it's inflation is their top issue or what the Supreme Court did with, with, with a woman's right. Uh, a lot of people will see after the election w which direction uh, Congress is going to go, but I think the president's going to stay focused on, on his agenda.